Welcome to this special United Nations Day episode of the World Stage podcast, where we are going to take a deep dive into the comprehensive planning and performance assessment system for United Nations peacekeeping operations, also known as CPAS. My name is Cedric de Koning, and I am a research professor here with the Norwegian Institute for International Affairs and your host for this episode. And with me are two guests from the United Nations. We have Kim Taylor, who is the chief of the evaluation team within the Division for Policy, Evaluation and Training of the Department of Peace Operations, and Hans Sachs, who is a program management officer in the same team. Kim has been in charge of the Comprehensive Planning and Performance Assessment System project from its design and inception in 2018. And Hans has been with the team for, I think, the last three and a half years or so. Maybe first I need to mention that I have been part of this project during its initial design and rollout because Emery Brousset and I did an assessment for the UN Peace Operations Department back in 2018 of the different tools the department was using at that time to assess performance. We found that there were a number of tools in place, but they all looked at specific areas of performance, such as the performance of individual staff members or the performance of whole units of military or police officers. But none of these tools gave the department the ability to assess the overall performance of an operation. We recommended at that time that the UN develop a comprehensive performance assessment system. And to our surprise, the recommendations was not only accepted, but we were also invited to help with the design and initial rollout of the system. It was a very interesting research practice collaboration, but we've not been directly involved since around mid-2019. So I'm also keen to hear how the system has developed and, and worked out so far. So let's get right into it. Let me first ask Kim, Kim, maybe we can start by you telling us what is the Comprehensive Planning and Performance Assessment System and why is it needed? What is the function of impact assessment in United Nations peacekeeping operations? Thanks, Cedric, and thank you for having us today. And uh, I really want to acknowledge the role that you and Emery played um, in the start of this. You and Emery are sort of the joint godfathers of the CPAS in a way. And uh, our special thanks to Nupi as well, who funded um, your involvement. And it's really fantastic to come back here, you know, five, six years later and come full circle because we've gone so far since we started with that report. Um, you know, it really came about because member states were asking, you know, we're pouring billions of dollars into peacekeeping each year. What are we getting back for that? And missions also and, and peacekeeping leadership wanted it because they felt that, that we were doing so much work in our operations, but it was really difficult to show show that return on investment for those funds. So the CPAS is basically an impact assessment system. Um, it's based on your report on international best practice for how you look at the theory of change. Um, and it's an iterative cycle that's constantly turning in our peacekeeping operations. And it basically consists of um, a, a logical or a results framework, a central plan that involves all areas of the mission. It's based on their mandate and the vision of the senior leadership. Um, and then the mission doing work against that plan. Um, but the plan has indicators and data attached to it. And so the missions are also collecting data while they do their work. And they then come together all the components of the mission um, to assess um, the progress against the plan and to analyze the data and performance. And from that, they make uh, recommendations, collective recommendations to senior leadership, um, along with a report on, on the impact and the progress. Um, and then senior leadership considers that report and decides which recommendations to endorse. So fundamentally, the whole purpose of the system is to really increase the evidence base uh, for decision making for senior leadership. But when you have a central framework like that and you build up a reliable database, um, there are just so many other benefits that flow from it. Um, that kind of all makes it sound really easy. It's actually really challenging. Um, assessing impact in complex conflicts 
is really difficult. Gathering data, reliable data in isolated areas where huge violations of human rights are happening is not straightforward, but primarily the CPAS um, does help missions both show the impact that they're having, but also strengthen that impact over time. And that helps um, everyone in the system, but gives that feedback to not just member states, but the governments of the countries we work in and the local populations that we work with, that despite the enormity of the conflict, of the chaos around them, that change is happening and that um, quite often it's positive change. So interesting because I, I, I found also when we were working on it initially that um, in order to drive adaptation, you need to generate the information on the basis of which decision making can be made, but you also need to create this kind of decision making cycle to, to create the space in the schedule of senior leaders to actually give attention to this, right? So I think that's very interesting from how you explained what CPAS is, how it drives and generates this information. When I prepared for this podcast, I discovered that, Hans, that you, you authored a report that took stock of the comprehensive planning and performance assessment system after the first four years that it has been in, in, in existence. Um, can you give us an example of how it works in a specific mission and how it will help a mission, the mission example that you may be in, how, in mind to help them to improve their effectiveness? Sure, thank you, Cedric, and allow me also to thank you for inviting us today. Um, I think um, I will choose an example uh, of the mission uh, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, so CPAS was rolled out there in uh, 2021. Um, uh, SISG Keita had been appointed and uh, she is a very data-driven person, uh, very forward-leaning on technologies, uh, leveraging technologies. So we had uh, um, uh, support from the leadership, uh, which is, uh, of course, uh, quite important. And uh, so the mission set out to develop a uh, sequenced whole of mission plan along the lines of what Kim just uh, described um, and uh, they uh, identified uh, indicators uh, to track progress against uh, their mandated uh, activities and uh, these indicators um, are at uh, two levels um, they are at the strategic level so for example to see how the security situation writ large uh, develops in a country but then uh, equally important there are indicators at the stakeholder level. So the methodology, as you know, very well know, foresees that um, uh, you identify the stakeholders that are key for mandate implementation. And then you see um, uh, what kind of change uh, you want to uh, see in these stakeholders, um, in knowledge, attitude, behavior, and then you develop indicators, and that's what the mission did, um, to see uh, um, if there is such change uh, and uh, if why and if not, why not. And so uh, the mission set out to do exactly that. And um, uh, we helped them, of course, identify uh, these indicators. And it was quite stunning when we went out to see how much data there was already in the mission. Um, but it was uh, siloed uh, in each of the mission's component. In particular, the human rights component had an incredible amount of data, but there was wealth of data across the missions in the DDR section with the justice section. And sometimes there was data that uh, um, needed to uh, be uh, consolidated a bit. But um, uh, by and large, uh, we helped them centralize this data and, uh, and also secure it and, and simplify the data gathering processes. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, then half a year later, we uh, um, helped them again for their first impact assessment. And this is quite a fascinating um, uh, experience. Uh, I have the privilege to co-facilitate these uh, impact assessments. And uh, we are utilizing the, the vast amount of expertise that is on the ground. So it is um, uh, uh, colleagues that are working in the mission from all sections coming together looking at the data, looking at the trend lines over time, what happened over the last half year, but also how that relates to events and uh, trends uh, earlier uh, uh, in that year or years before. And then they jointly analyze this data and see um, uh, what has changed uh, identify challenges, but also opportunities for engagement. And um, yeah, to give you maybe a concrete example of uh, operational improvement, 
um, MONUSCO, as most large missions, have a uh, protection working group. Most of your listeners will know that uh, um, the mandate is quite heavy on protection. And uh, as part of uh, their tasks, they identify areas um, on a regular basis that are particularly dangerous for uh, women and girls uh, to then inform the operational planning, in particular of the uniformed components, but also in general what the mission is doing. And uh, they pass these um, mappings uh, on to uh, the respective components. But in the impact assessment, it became clear that it wasn't entirely clear to those who developed these um, maps um, how they are being utilized and what information in these uh, uh, assessments and maps that result from it are particularly useful for the uh, uniformed components. So they agreed to um, uh, create a feedback loop uh, where now regularly um, there is information being brought back to those who develop these to, to fine tune it and, and see what is particularly useful. And they also agreed uh, that um, uh, now as the mission is continues to be in transition, um, that uh, it is really important to impart that knowledge to uh, national stakeholders, the national protection clusters uh, to, to do similar um, exercises in the future. So yeah, um, by and large, uh, it is SIPAS uh, works in MONUSCO now um, as an evidence-based uh, tool for good mission management. Every um, uh, impact assessment produces recommendations uh, for leadership, but also for the management levels. That's so interesting. I, I love the way uh, you describe how the process actually gives the peacekeepers, the civilian military peacekeepers agency in, in themselves, you know, not necessarily even having to wait for leadership to make a decision, but through the process discovering how things they can do to, to make the mission more effective. Uh, Kim, one of the core principles we, deply, we applied when we designed the, the comprehensive performance and assessment system was that it needs an iterative process of experimentation and reflection and learning um, that then informs the next cycle, I think, as, as Hans were explaining. And I was wondering how this principle has worked out in reality. Um, what were some of the challenges you experienced and what did you gain from this iterative adaptive approach to impact assessment? I remember even in the beginning, um, some of the missions found it quite work intensive to have this iterative approach. But I would love to hear how it's worked out in the meantime. It's worked out really well, but you're right. It made it feel heavier at the start in the sense that I think the missions were willing to do something that was one off, but then when they realised it would just keep coming back, <laughs> that it was sort of <laughs> inevitable, that it would keep rolling around no matter what they did to escape it. Um, so it was heavy at the start um, because we were asking a lot of staff to think differently about how they did their work. But there were so many advant advantages to what the system offered that staff really did come on board. But we did develop the CPAS very closely with the missions. I mean, you and Emery gave us a, a report, uh, an excellent but theoretical document, and our job was to really translate that into a concrete tool at the working level on the ground in, at the time, 13 peacekeeping operations around the world. And you can only successfully do that if the missions actually decide that they want to do it and they're going to do it properly. And we were so lucky that we had colleagues on the ground who saw the benefits of this. So we built it in iterative consultation with them where we would do a cycle in a mission and we would see how it goes. And as you recall, we sort of um, rolled it out mission by mission. We didn't start across 13 simultaneously. So we were rapidly learning lessons and applying them as we went. And we were really trying to reach, you know, with these iterative cycles, the right balance between reflecting um, the complexity and the effort required on one side and not compromising on stringency and accuracy on the other. I mean, maintaining the purity of the methodology, at least so far as you get reliable results, was something that was really important to us. Um, and today, that iterative nature of the CPATH remains, I think, a really important um, element of it. 
Um, you know, as I said before, assessing impact in complex conflicts is really difficult. Um, and a lot of the work of our peacekeeping operations cannot be seen in short reporting cycles. And many of them are on very sort of short re reporting cycles to the Security Council. You know, it takes time to build up a repository of data. Um, it, you, you, you need time and data to really be able to see trends over time, which is really important because some of the processes we're working on, political processes in particular, they do take a long time. But when you see these mapped out over not days or weeks or even months but years you can see that the line is moving slowly but in in the right direction um, I think some of the challenges though you know men included things like um, adjusting the frameworks getting them right you can have a perfect framework but if you can't attach real data to it it's actually really impossible to to assess and um, understand what's going on. Our peacekeeping operations also have a really high turnover of staff. So the iterative cycle has been really good at counterbalancing that because um, with everything centralised and digital, new people can come in and enter the system and see like what decisions have been taken and why and what actions have been taken from them. Um, but I still think we fight the constant demand of instantaneous reporting, you know, wanting to know immediately like what's going on, which, you know, we, we do operate in these often isolated and very chaotic situations. That's not easy. So the iterative nature of the CPAS I think is critical, but it's also an ongoing challenge. Fascinating. And I mean, obviously the, the idea behind the iterative cycle is that the context that you're in is constantly changing, is highly dynamic, and so the, the mission has to uh, co-evolve with the situation that it's in. And to do that, as you explained very well, there's a strong data element to CPAS. So let me turn to Hans and, and, and ask uh, for your insights and, and how the system actually collects data, how that is data is used to inform uh, CPAS and other impact assessment uh, processes. Thanks, Cedric. So as I already mentioned, uh, most missions already had data, and uh, that was in various form, Excel sheets on individual computers, um, in, in other databases. So um, uh, we tried to not duplicate, of course, but um, uh, take advantage of the existing data. And in many cases, our IT experts were able to just um, uh, uh, immediately uh, transport that into um, uh, our CPAS uh, IT platform. Um, uh, the indicators that were identified in addition, those are being um, uh, collected by staff in the field, sometimes in deep field locations, uh, most of the data in fact, um, but uh, what uh, the IT platform that our colleagues uh, in the CPAS team have developed also improved uh, tremendously is it's being directly entered into the platform now. So um, before there was an email going from one person to another and then from that to another and then someone entered it into an Excel sheet and of course, this process is quite error prone. So I think we have uh, managed to um, improve uh, the integrity of data through that. Um, uh, and as I already mentioned, this data is then being used for assessments. Um, uh, in, in these assessments, um, it is quite interesting to see how um, colleagues are challenging each other including about the data. So um, uh, in these assessments, if there is data collected by um, the POC group, uh, the human rights component might have some questions about that or some data that doesn't 100% match what uh, another component has uh, collected. So uh, the data is really being triangulated and also stress test tested. And, and by doing so, I think um, uh, the CPAS processes have also helped uh, improve uh, the quality of, of data. Um, um, uh, we have uh, managed to, um, our, our, one of our main principles is that there shouldn't be any double um, data entry. So um, uh, the CPAS platform is fully interoperable with all other systems that UN Peacekeeping is using and um, uh, the, it is connected with all other tools. Uh, we also um, uh, pull in data from the UN country team and from outside sources that we consider reliable. For example, ACLED, um, the uh, um, armed conflict 
conflict uh, location and event database, um, which is an open source database, but uh, very reliable. So we, we also use that uh, for background. And how this data is being used, uh, most missions are doing their assessment twice a year. They collect data normally on a monthly basis because it has turned out through the iterative uh, processes that this is the best uh, basis for having trend lines that uh, show uh, developments, um, but also then to be shown in maps if the data is geotagged. And uh, most of the data I should mention is also um, uh, gender disaggregated wherever possible to show uh, how the different phases of conflict impact different uh, parts of the society, but also what of the mission interventions has an impact on uh, women, girls, and, uh, and other parts of the society. And already, as already mentioned, this then feeds back into the planning cycle. And in particular, I want to stress uh, how the data is being used uh, for reporting. So um, Kim uh, mentioned that once you have this wealth of data, the, uh, the, the um, uh, ways in which you can use that are almost limitless. Um, we uh, managed to uh, change the format of the reports of the Secretary General, which was uh, a bit of an uphill battle, but um, we managed to do that and now more than half of the peacekeeping operations are regular using, regularly using um, uh, infographics, uh, um, data analytics in the SG reports. And equally important, um, most missions are now using uh, fact sheets that are being handed out during the briefings to the Security Council. So the SISG is bringing along with her or him um, a two-page fact sheet with data analytics uh, combined with analysis that is being handed out uh, to the Security Council during the briefings, and I think we have done uh, 28 to date um, and counting. Very interesting to see how the the data is, is partly driving the process, and the process is creating the vehicle for, for how the data is meaning. Very interesting, and also fascinating to hear that it's you know entering into Secretary General reports and that it's uh, being presented to the Security Council. Um, we are approaching the end of our time, so let me let's maybe take stock. Uh, Kim, can you summarize what has been some of the main benefits for the United Nations of having a comprehensive planning and assessment system like CPAS? Well, there's quite a few, I think, actually. Um, the CPAS, you know, it's a it's a tool that's very anchored in local context and looking at key stakeholders. It's a very people-centered tool, which I think is really important and something that wasn't so easy to do before with the kind of rigid budgeting tools that we had available to us. Um, and it's very responsive to changes It's a, uh, in that local context. It's a really flexible tool that enables missions to respond as best they can to adapt to the ever-changing situation on the ground. Um, it helps fundamentally, helps us fundamentally understand the impact of each of our peacekeeping operations. You know, there are thousands of um, staff and soldiers and police around the world doing really difficult work and doing an amazing job, and we're able to, to demonstrate that. Um, but as well as showing the impact we're having and all those data benefits that Hans was talking about, we're also slowly strengthening impact and we're, you know, really pushing... Uh, senior leadership to respond to these recommendations and help direct the mission um, to improve mandate implementation. You know, that's, that's slow and incremental because our operations are large and some of these issues are really well known, they're not easily resolved. Um, but I think the, the utility of centralising the data under the CPAS um, doesn't just help us with that, it enables us to do so many other things. It helps us tackle the difficult issues of gender and women, peace and security. It helps missions improve their strategic communications. It helps break down silos inside missions. It helps missions in the same region work together better. Um, and as that data grows, um, that, that opportunity is just going to grow as well. Mm. So what's next for CPAS? Which, which direction do you see CPAS developing in? I think the data element 
will grow the most. Like the amount of, you know, we have about 86,000 data impact points at the moment and the growth is exponential. And that's incredibly exciting because um, now that the project, you know, really, it's not a pilot anymore. It's a, it's a tool that's operating in these operations, in these peacekeeping operations. So it means that we can, we already do connect with other databases, um, both inside the UN family, but also externally. And I think that will happen more and more. And we hope to see greater interoperability between tools so that data can be shared back and forth. And once you can, you know, you do that more and more, then you can really start to work with partners to try and tackle some of the challenges that are so systemic to um, peacekeeping. I think looking more inwardly, um, we'll continue to build bespoke dashboards for our missions. Um, we get a lot of requests for that, you know, whether it's, as Hans was talking about, monitoring human rights or protection of civilian hotspots. Um, and there are so many, like uh, many of our missions have very broad mandates. So there's so many different areas that we can be developing uh, ways of monitoring the data and visualising it to help our colleagues do their work better. And then I think that... Um, the uh, eventual drawdown and transition of our missions as we exit these countries, as hopefully peace takes hold and life begins to become normalised um, in a peaceful way, that uh, we'll be really working on how we monitor the markers for when we can start to hand over functions um, and to help our exit strategy out of these out of these places and to hand that data and those dashboards over to what we call you know the UN country team, the UN representatives who remain after peacekeeping operations have left. And I guess because it's such a popular thing at the moment, um, artificial intelligence is one area we have started to explore. We talked at the start of this podcast about some of the heavier elements of the system. And one of them is when you bring everyone to together, to, together to discuss performance, um, there's a lot of animated discussion. And so someone has to record all of that and then extract the key findings and the recommendations. And so um, you know, one of the areas we're looking at is how can we use AI to reduce that burden and speed up um, those processes. And um, th that's what we're thinking of now, probably in a few years' time. AI will be doing way more than that. And, you know, we hope to remain um, a sort of cutting edge technology project um, and tool for peacekeeping. And so we'll always be looking for these opportunities to utilise technology to improve our work on the ground. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that, both of you. We're actually recording this podcast on the 24th of October, which is United Nations Day. So it's fantastic that we have the chance to, to zero in today, that we had the chance to zero in on this uh, UN's uh, uh, special comprehensive performance and assessment system for measuring impact assessment. And, to, and it was great to hear from both of you how the progress that you've made over the last six years. So thank you very much and good luck for, for the continuation of your work. Thanks, Cedric. Thanks, Cedric.